there is a darkness in humanity that has manifested itself in a lust for blood throughout the ages. The Old Testament and ancient myths catalog murder and revenge as part of the fabric of life in ancient times. Cain slew Abel. Romulus slew Remus. Unleashing the beast within is a possibility for all of us. The decision to kill from passion or premeditation has often defined our world, past, present, and future. Wars have terrorized entire populations for thousands of years. The American West was home to ruthless killers who were idolized in fiction and folklore. Evil evolved to a hideous new form with the genocidal dictators of the 20th century, such as Hitler, Stalin, and Mao Zedong who ordered the death of tens of millions. But in the middle of the 20th century, a new and chilling phenomenon emerged in post-war Western society, the serial killer. As if fashioned from our nightmares, they terrify and fascinate us. Lurking behind masks of bland normality, they often evade capture for years, decades, or eternity. They are America's serial killers. We killed her. We dumped her body off, and that was it. Nothing to it. Every year in this country, we have about 20 serial killers. 10 of whom are apprehended, 10 of whom are on the loose. And they are, in total, responsible for some 200 deaths. So 200 victims of serial killers on a yearly basis. And what makes this particularly important for us is that the average serial killer is responsible for 10 deaths. That's a huge body count. America's serial killers, Portraits and Evil, will strip the covers from a world of profiling and forensic science as we expose America's most brutal serial killers. By the beginning of the 1930s, the idea of the serial killer as the most heinous of all criminals was well established in America's popular culture. So much so that Hollywood began making movies about this monster that were horrifying, yet at the same time, fascinating. If you're gonna define someone as a serial killer, the motivation uh, for their crimes comes from inside them and for in, from their perception of the world as opposed to say for money or for personal gain specifically. They're killing because they like it and because they want to. For a serial killer you have uh, an event and then a period of time and then another event and then another period of time. It's done over and over over a longer period of time Beyond this commonality of killing multiple victims over time and in different places, four spectacular cases, four very different serial killers, defied logic in understanding the reason behind their terrible acts. Jack the Ripper slashed his way through 19th century London for four months. His brutal slayings of prostitutes terrorized the city. Taunting letters to the police chilled detectives. Then, at the height of his horror, 
his fame assured as the world's first and most notorious serial killer, he disappeared into the night fog without a trace. In the United States, Jane Topan, a nurse, an angel of mercy, killed quietly, hell-bent on, in her own words, to have killed more people, more helpless people, than any man or woman who has ever lived. Stunned police detectives could not fathom why this quiet, respected lady, lethal syringe in hand, killed 31 people without a qualm. Without an apparent motive. They chalked it up to heredity. She was a bad seed. Perhaps the most prolific of all serial killers was H. H. Holmes. With ruthless efficiency, he murdered hundreds. His M.O. was very different than the first two well-known serial killers. In Chicago, he constructed an elaborate castle of horrors with gas chambers for killing, dissecting tables for making skeletons for medical schools, and furnaces for disposing of the remains. Completely without remorse, his motive for killing greed. Lastly, there was Albert Fish. Depraved and indifferent, a terrifying hunger burned for the souls of children. But his depravity did not stop there. Butchering his young victims, he cooked their remains and ate them. He was the worst of the first wave of serial killers, with no motive except the brutality of his crimes. For criminologists and psychologists, it was hard to find anything in common among these monsters except that they were serial killers. And when they weren't killing, they functioned more or less normally in society. Serial killing seemed to be a choice. With serial killers, what you run into is, you know, with very few exceptions, uh, a motivation that is essentially internal. Uh, the framework and the context into which their crimes have to be viewed came from their own mind. Uh, it was the result of a fantasy fulfillment or uh, a, a desire that wasn't put on them by anybody else, that didn't fit into a larger context like a larger crime. Um, you know, you could look at Jesse James as a serial killer, but he was a bank robber who killed people. Um, a serial murder, murderer, you, I suppose on a certain level you might say of some, oh, they were a rapist who killed their victims. But the, the fact is that the, the result of it was for some sort of abstract gain. In the mid-1930s, something odd happened in America. Serial killing all but disappeared. It was the time of the Great Depression. The Great Depression struck in 1929, when the high-flying and corrupt living of the Roaring Twenties came to an abrupt end with the stock market crash on Black Tuesday, October 29th. Dazed by the sudden and catastrophic loss of wealth, the country reeled into an economic tailspin that put millions out of work, crushed industry, and shattered lives. The downturn did not let up, and for 10 long years, the nation suffered through the worst economy it had ever known. Following the Great Depression, for another decade, World War II and the Cold War focused America's attention on defeating fascism and confronting communism. Incredibly, during this nearly 20-year period, there were no prominent serial killers, with one exception. 
It was the 1945 to 1946 case of the Lipstick Killer. Right from the beginning, the press gave serial killers AKAs or nicknames. Jack the Ripper, H.H. H. Holmes, the Doctor of Death, Jane Topan, the Angel of Death, then Albert Fish, the Vampire of Brooklyn. It's as if there was an alter ego, a split personality, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This idea would play a role in the defense of William Hirons, the infamous lipstick killer. William Hirons was different from earlier serial killers. Born in 1929, he grew up in an affluent Chicago family and started his killing at an early age, as a teenager. The lipstick killer. And he would, after killing a, a female victim, uh, go into her bathroom and take her lipstick and scrawl, catch me before I kill again. He apparently felt guilty and wanted to get apprehended. By the age of 13, young Bill had become a pretty strange boy. He took to petty crime, burglary, and cross-dressing. Then, on June 3, 1945, Hirons was looting the Chicago apartment of Josephine Ross when his victim woke and caught him in the act. Attacking ruthlessly, he cut her throat and stabbed her several times. Later, he said, I wandered aimlessly from room to room, enjoying multiple orgasms. Five months later, 33-year-old Frances Brown emerged from her bathroom to find Hirons rifling through her purse. As she began to scream, he shot her twice and then fetched a kitchen knife to finish off the job. Dragging his victim into the bathroom, Hirons tried in vain to wash her blood away, then left her draped across the tub, half covered with a house coat. This is when he wrote in lipstick, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. A month later, on January 7, 1946, he invaded the bedroom of six-year-old Suzanne Degnan, abducting the child. Retreating to a nearby basement, Hirons murdered the child and dismembered her remains with a hunting knife. Six months later, the 17-year-old Hirons was caught attempting another burglary and confessed to killing the three women. Except, Hirons claimed that it was not actually he who killed the women. It was his alter personality, George Merman, short for murder man, who killed those women. It was the classic Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde defense. Hirons' psychological excuse was originally the literary invention of Scottish writer Robert Louis Stevenson in his classic novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Written in 1886, Stevenson's brilliant psychological portrayal of dual personalities was a vivid examination of the nature of good and evil. In the 1932 movie, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, based on the novella, Frederick March plays the respectable and well-mannered Dr. Henry Jekyll. In this scene, he eloquently explains the two sides of the human personality. The soul of man. My analysis of this soul, the human psyche, leads me to believe that man is not truly one but truly two, 
One of him strives for the nobilities of life. This we call his good self. The other seeks an expression of impulses that bind him to some dim animal relation with the earth. This we may call the bad. Henry Jekyll proves his theory by creating a potion and drinking it. Jekyll's alternate personality, the brutal and eventually murderous Mr. Hyde, emerges. But Dr. Jekyll has meddled too deep into the human psyche and can no longer control the surfacing of the bestial Mr. Hyde. Hyde is now in complete control and kills his lover. Like the police in the case of William Hirons, the police in the movie discover that there is no way to keep Hyde bottled up. There is no way that Jekyll can be trusted. The only answer is death. In the 1940s and 50s, psychologists used the Jekyll and Hyde story as a metaphor to explain the murderous behavior of some serial killers. Indeed, the words Jekyll and Hyde have become a part of mainstream American culture to mean a person with both good and evil personalities. We like to see these serial killers as having uh, multiple personalities. Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Actually, it isn't so much that they change personalities. It's more that they have a small circle of friends and relatives who are off limits. They focus almost always on absolute strangers. And anything goes when they target strangers. But with their own families and friends, they look like decent ordinary people. The jury also didn't buy William Hiron's argument that he was innocent because his evil Mr. Hyde side did the killing. As the youngest serial killer ever incarcerated, young William Hiron spent the rest of his long life in jail. With Hiron's in prison, once again, serial killers faded from the American consciousness. The 50s came, and with it, memories of war and depression also faded. Once again, it was let the good times roll. Americans spread out to the suburbs. With new, more powerful cars and cheap gasoline, they became mobile in a way never seen before on the planet. At the same time, television shined its light on all sorts of cruel and inhuman acts. Warfare. Riots. And segregation. Then, in 1957, 
a lonely man in rural Wisconsin shocked the nation to its core and began the greatest wave of serial murder the world has ever seen. The depravity of this man knew no limits. He was Ed Gein. Certain serial killers have become these, these um, you know, successfully become the bogeyman of their generation. Certainly Albert Fish was the bogeyman of his generation and uh, um, Ed Gein was the bogeyman of his generation. The press attention to his case was enormous and he certainly ushered in what would then become uh, uh, an open floodgate of uh, aberrant murderers in uh, not only the United States, but other, other places in the world. Edward Gein uh, was a cannibal. He practiced necrophilia. He robbed body parts from graves. He killed people and dressed them out like deer. He even shared the venison with his neighbors, and they were literally sickened when they discovered that it wasn't venison at all. Uh, and yet, Edward Gein is hardly a household word. Believe me, if he had done the same heinous crimes in New York City or Los Angeles, everybody would know his name, just like they know Son of Sam or the Sunset Strip Killer. But Edward Gein killed outside of Plainfield, Wisconsin, population 632, small town breadbasket America. Born in 1906, Ed Gein and his brother Henry grew up on a Wisconsin farm that looked like this. Their father was a drunkard and their mother was a religious zealot who taught young Ed that all women were bad. All were prostitutes, except for herself, of course. The brothers tried to make their mother happy, but she was rarely pleased with her precious boys. She often verbally abused them, believing that they were destined to become failures like their drunken father without proper guidance. During their teens and throughout their early adulthood, the boys remained detached from people. Working their farmstead, they only had each other for company. Then, the older Henry Gein began to reject his mother's distorted view of the world and Ed's perverse attachment to her. He even spoke ill of her to his mortified brother, an act for which Henry would soon pay the ultimate price. While fighting a brush fire in 1944, Cain slew Abel. Although Ed was able to lead the authorities directly to Henry's body, a body which had bruises around the head, the event was dismissed as an accident. With the father already dead, Ed finally had his mother all to himself. But not for long. Within a year, she would be dead from a heart attack. His mother was this incredibly powerful figure who dominated his existence, and her death um, both devastated him and let his inner illness free. Now this rural farmhouse was about to become an infamous house of horrors a house that preserved his mother's dead body as a shrine. Soon, the lonely Ed began making nightly raids into the local cemeteries, digging up corpses of women and bringing the bodies back to his home. They talked about him having a box full of vulvas. And that just, that just kind of stuck in my mind and creeped me out more than anything else was that he would dig up dead women and cut out their sexual parts and put them in a box. I just can't. 
you know? There's people who kill people, right? And everybody has anger and everybody in their lives at one time or another is like, oh, I could kill that person or whatever. And then you have these sort of rapist slash killers, these people who sexually utilize a, a person and then dispose of them, you know, that, pretty common, you know. And again, you, you, you can't imagine doing it, but you can at least say, oh, I can, I can see it. I can understand the, on some sick level where they're, but a guy who digs people up and takes their sexual organs and puts them in a box, boy, that's, that is out there. By 1954, necrophilia, the sexual attraction and use of corpses, was no longer enough. Ed shot a local tavern keeper, Mary Hogan, and brought her 200-pound corpse back to his house of horrors. Three years later, he killed another woman, a 58-year-old grandmother, Bernice Warden. But this time, suspicion fell on Ed. And when police broke into this rural farmhouse, they found the most horrific scene of all time. They found Warden's decapitated body, her headless corpse hung upside down. The body was dressed out like that of a deer. Looking further, the authorities found chairs upholstered with human skin. Soup bowls fashioned from skulls. Faces mounted on the wall like hunting trophies. And a full female skin that Gein confessed he enjoyed dressing himself in and pretending he was his mother. In the refrigerator, were organs, parts of which Weird Ed had been preserving to eat. In all, parts from 13 different women were identified in the old farmhouse. You, you take these bizarre cases where there's this cannibalistic element, where the murderer will actually mutilate, perhaps even consume body parts, clearly, in virtually every one of these instances. What you're dealing with is a murderer who is so disturbed psychiatrically that he feels the need to experience the toxic fruits of his labor. He almost needs to take this into his own body as a way to confirm that he's killed this person. It makes it that much more real. And that's a serious psychiatric illness. Indeed, after 10 years in a mental hospital, Gein was judged competent to stand trial. Ed was found guilty. He lived out his life in a mental hospital, where he died of natural causes at the age of 77. But by this time, he had become immortalized in Alfred Hitchcock's brilliant psychological thriller, Psycho. And in 1991, was in part the inspiration for Hannibal Lecter in The Silence of the Lambs. And nine years later, for American Psycho. While Ed Gein never terrorized his local community, the Boston Strangler was, in many ways, a repeat of the original serial killer, Jack the Ripper. In America, the naive optimism of the 1950s was followed by the new frontier of a daring young president, John F. Kennedy. It was a time when anything was possible. Ironically, it was from JFK's home area of Boston, Massachusetts, that one of the most deranged serial killers of all time opened a new chapter in sadistic behavior. He was the rather handsome, charming Albert DeSalvo, AKA the Boston Strangler. With Albert DeSalvo, the, the Boston Strangler, you have a guy who was 
by all accounts, a sexual satyr. He was insatiable sexually. Um, and while that doesn't necessarily, you know, necessitate, you know, becoming a rapist or a killer, um, at the core of his being was an almost unsatisfiable desire for sexual satisfaction. You combine that with the fact that he was apparently a very personable guy. Uh, he had con man sort of characteristics. That was obviously part of his MO, part of his enjoyment of it was to ingratiate himself into the homes of these women and then to rape them and eventually to kill them and not only to kill them but to taunt those who would find their bodies, whether they be family members of the police, by posing them grotesquely, um, by making tableaus that were clearly intended to continue the shock and disgust with his crimes beyond just what he did, but to um, the people that found them to cause pain and anguish in them. Uh, that's, that level of sadism he certainly possessed. Born in 1931, Albert was a product of a brutal and abusive childhood. At an early age, he showed signs of what was to come when he sadistically tortured animals. The truth is, we can identify predictors. We know that 14-year-olds who torture animals, who set fires, may have within them the seeds down the road of serial killing. We need to identify, for example, teenagers who themselves were often the victims of abuse, who may be tomorrow's serial killer. We need to be able to identify them, to provide them with the mental health services they so desperately need. And I fully believe, having been in this field for a long time, that early intervention with kids who are manifesting signs of major mental illness, who have histories of victimization themselves, who are setting fires and torturing animals, that can prevent serial killing. Is there a guarantee? No. But we're playing with probability here. We're playing with odds. I fully believe that conscientious intervention in that kind of instance has the potential to prevent a serial killing. But none intervened with Albert DeSalvo. He was well primed to follow this course into sadistic terror and sex. Turning to crime at the age of 12, Albert escaped prosecution for petty thefts by joining the army in 1948. At the age of 24, Albert was discharged from the military for molesting a nine-year-old girl. At the same time, his wife reported that he had an insatiable sexual appetite, demanding sex as much as seven times a day. In 1960, he was imprisoned for burglary and lewd behavior. But one year later, he was back on the street and now escalated to rape. Police estimate that he may have raped as many as 300 women. But soon, sadistic sex was not enough. Before the murders began, Albert DeSalvo was a rapist who was, whose crimes were known to police and they had a nickname for him. And so he went through a progression from rape to murder um, that didn't necessarily involve the fact that he had gotten caught previously and he now wanted to silence his potential accusers. He, uh, he moved on to murder, I think, on his own. For nearly two years, he killed freely, murdering 13 women and terrorizing Boston. At first, he preyed upon the weak. Anna E. Slessers, 55 years old, was the first to die. On June 14, 1962, DeSalvo raped, then killed her with what would become his signature of death. He strangled Anna. He then left the ligature, in this case, the cord from her bathrobe, around her neck in an ornamental bow. 
Unsated in his lust, DeSalvo raped and strangled twice more 16 days later. 68-year-old Nina Nichols and 65-year-old Helen Blake. Then, for more than a month, Boston was quiet. Perhaps the Boston Strangler had had enough. But DeSalvo struck again. On August 21st, 75-year-old Ida Erga let DeSalvo into her apartment and died. By now, Boston was in a frenzy. Terror stalked the streets as the Strangler seemed to appear at will whenever he wanted. When the snow-filled holiday of Christmas arrived, the Strangler struck twice. His M.O. had changed. This time, he targeted two young women, Sophie Clark, 19, and Patricia Bissett, 23. Both were raped, then strangled with DeSalvo's trademark, nylon stockings. No woman in Boston was safe. Young and old were all targets of the brutal strangler. Though months passed between rapes and killings, the terror never let up. On May 8th, it was 23-year-old Beverly Salmon's time to die, this time by stabbing. Then on January 4th, 1964, six weeks after JFK's assassination, the Strangler opened the new year with the murder and rape of Mary Sullivan. Thirteen women, brutally raped, sadistically murdered. Their lifeless bodies left behind to terrorize one of America's oldest cities, its most treasured home of liberty. No place in America was sacred any longer to serial killers. Clearly, DeSalvo loved killing. Sadistic killing associated with sex. The joining of sex and killing is a common factor among Hirons, Gyne, and DeSalvo. Particularly, DeSalvo's sadistic sexual stranglings. What is more powerful, what is more sexually stimulating than have power over a person's life or death? In many cases, a serial killer will strangle a person to the point of them passing out and then release them. And then do it again, and do it again, and do it again. Until they finally decide, okay, you're dead. So they stay with the person and the person will strangle to death. DeSalvo initiated another aspect of serial killing, the terrorizing of an entire community by the publicity made possible through the instant news of the new electronic medium, television. Between 1962 and 1964, for a period of about a year and a half, the Boston Strangler terrorized the women of Boston. There, during that period of time, uh, women just didn't go out on the streets alone. Not after dark. They were always in a group because they were scared to death. Who would be the next victim? As um, Albert DeSalvo continued to kill and the public outcry became greater and greater and greater, it's a testament to two things. Number one, his ability to be ingratiating to people obviously was so strong that even after there was a known killer who killed people in their homes, he was able to continue to get into women's homes by talking his way in. That's kind of an amazing thing to think about. And also, he, as, as that public outcry became greater and greater, the posing of the victims and the, the, um, the tableau that he left behind was clearly designed to create more hoopla, to create more attention. Uh, there's, it's obvious that he enjoyed not only the acts he was committing, but the public response. As is often the case with serial killers, DeSalvo's capture was a fluke. 
he sexually assaulted a young woman, then left suddenly, saying, I I'm sorry, as he went. The woman's description led police to DeSalvo. When his photo was published, many women identified him as the man who had raped them. It was only after he was charged with rape that he gave a detailed confession of his activities as the sadistic Boston Strangler. Oddly, only charged with rape, he went to trial with the famous courtroom lawyer F. Lee Bailey representing him. Bailey pleaded insanity. Once again, the jury bought none of it. In 1967, the sexual sadist Albert DeSalvo was sentenced to life in prison. Six years later, he was found stabbed to death in Walpole State Prison. But the story of the Boston Strangler did not end there. As the 1978 movie Halloween showed, showed what everyone already knew, the boogeyman cannot be killed, cannot be caught, can never be contained. For years, the identity of the Boston Strangler as Albert DeSalvo has been disputed. The real Boston Strangler is still on the loose in the minds of many. It's somewhat questionable regarding the Boston Strangler whether Albert DeSalvo was in fact the Boston Strangler today. Uh, there's a, certainly a controversy brewing around that particular issue. And there's some more uh, forensic evidence they're attempting to, to seek and they're attempting to uh, uh, dig up some of the uh, victims in terms of forensic evidence. But it's only a controversy. However, the signature in all the killings, the sexual sadism through strangling, points to one man, Albert DeSalvo. It was pretty much established that he was a measuring man. In other words, he would go into uh, apartments and talk about modeling and give some kind of song and dance and then measure the women's uh, figure or a future reference as far as he was concerned. And as to whether he was the uh, Boston Strangler, as I said, there's still some controversy about that, particularly in the last year or two. But uh, his, as far as his signature is concerned, I guess the fact that he strangled his, his victims. Strangulation, I think, was not only the MO, but the signature. In other words, they can both be the same thing at times. Other times, they're both different. 